I'm going to do a, a series on faith. Faith. I want to look at faith from a few different angles and challenge us in our faith in some areas in our life. Are you a person of faith? Okay. The Bible tells us that God has given to every person a level of faith, a measure of faith. So you have faith, it just depends whether you use it. Okay? To be a part of the body of Christ, we, uh, we must have faith. All of us fit somewhere into the body of Christ, hopefully. Okay? And uh, my goal and, uh, is that we would find our niche in the body of Christ so that we be effective for Christ. God has a plan for your life. Whether you like it or you don't like it, he has a plan for your life. It just depends whether you fit within that plan. Whether we're listening to God, whether we have the ability to hear from God. I just want to read a passage of scripture out of um, uh, Romans chapter 12. It says, For by grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. This is Paul's talking to the Roman church and he's, uh, he's telling them that we need to find our spot because it goes on in verse 4, for just as each of us has one body with many members and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ... We, though many, form one body and each member belongs to all the others. We all have different gifts according to the grace given to us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy. If your gift in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. But God, you have to have faith to believe for whatever gift God has given to you. And uh, it's my goal that we all find that place in the body in our gifting. Faith. In, um, math, in uh, Hebrews chapter 11 and uh, verse one says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. And then in verse 6 it says, and without faith it is impossible to please God, because, please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who diligently or earnestly seek him. Last week I spoke, uh, about, I spoke about the beginning. In the beginning was the word. And we heard that Jesus was there in the beginning and that Jesus is the one who formed the earth. Everything within the earth was made by him. Do you believe that? Everything. In the beginning, there was nothing. And Jesus, God, created everything out of nothing. You have to have faith for that. Hebrews tells you you have to have faith to believe that. Okay? Faith. It says faith... Now, faith is confidence of what we hope for and the assurance of what we don't see. Most of us, or all of us, must have had confidence to walk into this building this morning and have the assurance that somehow it wouldn't collapse on us as we were in here. You must have had faith to believe that the chair that you're sitting on right now would hold you up. Well, I know you believe it, but uh, what assurance 
have you got of that? You've got the assurance because you have tested it and therefore you haven't fallen through the, that seat. Okay? What you hope for? I want to challenge us in some areas in our lives that maybe we haven't got together, that God wants you to have together. Okay? Your marriage, your children, your health, your finances, your home. I don't know where you are with all these things, but um, I want to suggest that uh, we can have a fantastic marriage. You can have good relationships with people. You can be uh, confident that God, if you seek first the kingdom, the Bible says, seek first the kingdom and all these things shall be added unto you. You can have confidence that if you seek first the kingdom, that uh, God will look after you. Who believes that? What you hope for? Your job? Your calling? What are you called to? Do you know what you're called to? The assurance of eternal life. If I was to ask you today, if you, uh, if you have the assurance of eternal life, why are you going to heaven? Why? Could you tell me? Most people hopefully could tell me. But can you tell me? You know, um, if you were to go out the street and you ask people and you say, uh, have you got the assurance of going to heaven? And, uh, and you ask them, well, why? And they would come back with answers like this. Because I'm a good person. Because I haven't uh, done anything really bad. Uh, because I read the Bible. Because I go to church. Because... I give to the poor. Some will say, because I've been baptised. Well, they're all good things, but none of those things will get you to heaven. None of those things will get you to heaven. The only way that we can have the assurance of going to heaven is because Jesus paid the penalty for our sin, and our sin has been dealt with on the cross. You have, to faith, you have to have faith. You have to believe that. Last week I also spoke about the Gospel of John. And I gave an introduction to the Gospel of John. And uh, in the Gospel of John, there are at least 90 places in the Gospel of John where the word believe is there. Do you believe? So believing is a main theme of John's Gospel. And uh, we even have it in uh, uh, the, the purpose of John's Gospel. In verse 30 it says, of chapter 20 it says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book. It says, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. His whole purpose in his writing is that people would believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that Jesus is the one that gives us the ability to have eternal life. Only through Jesus. Faith, to believe that. We have to have faith. 
My will, my desire is that we would reach a much higher level of faith this year. Not a little bit higher, much higher. Okay? Wherever you're living, that we would have, that we would believe that Jesus is interested in our life and that he will provide for us the things that we need to live by so that we can be effective for the body of Christ. That, that believe that, I, that, that we are effective in the body of Christ. By believing. Now, faith is having confidence in what we hope for Assurance of what we don't see. Okay? So if there's something that we need that we don't have, that we want to believe God for, that we want to have faith for, the things we have to hope for, to have confidence. Do you have confidence in Jesus Christ? Not only for your salvation, but do you have confidence that... He will provide your needs. That's what faith is. The assurance about what we do not see. In verse 6 it says, Without faith it is impossible to please God, because, we, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. We must believe that he earnestly, if we earnestly seek him, he will reward us for that. That's what the Bible tells us. Faith. In uh, Matthew chapter 8, I want to read some verses in Matthew chapter 8. This is after Jesus was coming down from the mount after, after preaching the uh, Sermon on the Mount, as he came down, the people were gathering around. Here we go in verse 8. It says, When Jesus came down from the mountainside, <coughs> large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me heal, clean. He's, he said, Lord, if you are willing... You can make me clean. And so the leper knew that Jesus could make him clean. His only question is, is he willing? Is Jesus willing to meet your need? Do you know the will of God? Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. He says, I am willing. He said, be clean. Immediately he was cleansed from his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. I'm not going to go into that passage too much. It's could take time. But under the law, if somebody had to get, be, be declared cleansed from leprosy, they had to have a, a clearance from the priests. When he entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking help, asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, Shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and he said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have, not found, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. 
And we go down to verse 13 and said, then, then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, let it be done just as, as you believe it would. His servant was healed at that very at that moment. Jesus said, Such great faith have I not seen in Israel. Therefore, there must be a key to faith in this passage of Scripture. I made it as a, a bit of a comment in one of my messages a little earlier. But why did the centurion have such great faith that others didn't have? Why? There's a key there. There's a key there for us to learn by. He was a military man. Okay, he had a centurion, so he must have had a hundred people under him. In, in, in the same terms, in the Australian army, he would have been a captain or a major in charge of a, a company of people. And he says, He says, for I am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. This one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. He understood that the word that is spoken is assured. He has total confidence for his supplies because he has been told he would have supplies. He speaks to one person, he does, to, to do something, he does it. Doesn't question it, doesn't argue about it, doesn't uh, worry about it, doesn't, just does it. it. It ought to be the same for us, that if there's something written or that's something that Jesus says, that means that's it. Because he said to Jesus, he says, say but the word and my servant will be healed. I trust your word 100%. You don't have to come and do what you... Just speak it. Whatever Jesus says, whatever the word says, that's it. That's gospel. Never questioned it. This is the place where we have to get, where we trust the word 100%. The words of Jesus, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, so it was talking about Jesus, and the word was made flesh. So the word is Jesus, and everything in the word, who believes the word is the word of God? Would God lie? I thought you had your hand up to say that he would lie, but no, you. That's good. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm happy with that. So his word is assured, right? Well, see, the, the centurion trusted Jesus at his word 100%. Would you, be, would you be so confident? See, we have to reach the place where we are 100% we are confident. You see, the word of God, something you don't see. See, when he left his home or wherever he was, his servant was paralyzed. He wasn't just a little bit sick, he was paralyzed. Say, but the word and my servant will be healed. Jesus offered to go with him. If it was me, I would have said, come. The first principle of faith is whatever Jesus says is true. Okay? Whatever Jesus says is true. We don't doubt. Faith, doubt, is 
opposite to faith. So we must trust the word 100%. In this room, I don't have to be too prophetic to say there are some needs in this room. Jesus can meet every need that's in this room. He can meet every he can meet every need in this room. Whether he is able to, he is able to as well, but whether he will depends on us. See whether he meet the needs depends on us. See, we often have faith to believe that God can and not faith to believe that he will. You see, there's two opposing. We believe that he can, but for somehow we don't believe that he will. Well, I want to suggest that we can get to that place where we can know that he will. Because that's important. Because... By knowing that he can and not believing that he will gives us nothing. So the first principle is that we need to take Jesus at his word. We learned that from a centurion. He had 100% confidence because he was a military man and he understood the, how, it, how it functioned I was a military person and therefore I understood that therefore if we had to go to a certain place and they said there were something, certain things were there, you could go up there and you can be assured that what they said would be there would be there. Total confidence in the chain of command, in the supplies from the government, or whatever it's about, you can be assured that it will be there. We have to be assured that it will be there, whatever we need. I want to talk about one other principle of, of uh, faith. Okay? The principle of sowing and reaping. In Galatians chapter 6, and verse 7 says, Do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please the flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at a proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. What you sow is what you reap. I want to suggest that if we want to see things happening, we've got to start sowing. And we will reap. It's a principle. It's a principle uh, in your garden. It's a principle in life. It's a principle from the Word of God. If you want your marriage to blossom, you have to sow into that marriage. You see, the centurion didn't have blind faith. He knew. Many of us at different times believe that all I've got to do is just pray and it will happen. 
And when it doesn't happen, we start looking at, am I not good enough? Uh, or we look for a better prayer. A better pr Your prayers are better than my prayers. That, that's a thought that comes to us. I'm not against it. I'm, I'm for it. If we need to pray for some, something or someone, do it. Pray as many as we like. Pray. I've got no question, no, no problem about it. But the reality is, all of our prayers should be as equal value. So your prayers should be of same value as mine. The Bible says that God is no respecter of persons. No respecter of persons. God is a God of principles. He's a God of his word. You know, sometimes we pray, well, well, God might feel sorry for me and help me. I'm sorry, God won't feel sorry for you. He's a, he, he has to work with his word. We have to fill, fulfill some of the conditions for some of God's promises. I remember I was doing visitation in, in uh, a couple of prisons and I went into uh, <coughs> Barwon Prison and one of the guys I was visiting there uh, said to me, he said, I've arranged a meeting for you. I said, oh, that's nice. He said, I want you to come to the library because I want, to, I want you to explain to these guys how forgiveness works. And uh, there was about a dozen guys there. And uh, they knew they had done things wrong. And they knew that they had... The one thing, when you go into prison, you don't have to explain what sin is. They know what sin is. It's more when you come out of a prison when people live in normal society, when some say, well, I'm not a sinner. Well, the Bible says that we're all sinners. Okay? And... Uh, and I explained to them that how forgiveness works, that God can't just forgive you for the sake of wanting to forgive you. He can't do that. Because God is a God of love, but he's also a God of justice. Okay, And so therefore, he is a just God, and therefore the penalty for sin has to be paid. What God did is that he came out of heaven and then he paid the penalty for man's sin and if they would believe and repent, they could be forgiven of their sins. So I had to explain to them that as gracious as God is, he can't just forgive you. But what he has done for you, he has, uh, he, he, his only son, Jesus Christ, came on the earth and he paid the penalty for sin. And if you were prepared to accept that he paid the penalty for your sin and repent, which means you've got to turn from the way you're living, that way you can get saved. That way you can be forgiven. So God can forgive, but only if, if, he, only if the penalty for sin has been paid for. You see? So therefore, God loves you, the Bible tells us God loves us. God loves us with passion. God wants to meet your needs. But some things require a condition. Some, condi some promises of God are unconditional. See, God's love for you is unconditional. In society, often we find that uh, for us to love somebody, uh, it's conditional. Or well, the instruction that God gives us, it should be unconditional. But the reality is sometimes the, con the condition is, well, if you love me, I'll love you. Or if you do good to me, I'll do good to you. But if you hate me or you do bad things to me, I won't love you. You see? Well, so therefore, if I have disobeyed God and have hurt God, God will still love me. Because his love is unconditional. 
It, 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 it's, not, it's not even governed by my feelings. I believe that. The Bible says it, and that's, I, I, I accept that. It's the truth. You see, sometimes our faith is determined by our feelings. I feel that God doesn't love me this morning. But in fact, he does love me this morning. He loves me all the time. Uh, it's just that my feelings and my emotions are not in line with the word of God. Feelings. The problem is many of us are going by feelings or our intellect. I don't feel to do this, I don't want to do this, and therefore I won't do it. Even if it's something that God has asked me to do. God is not like that. But God does want us to respond to him. He does want us to ask. Interesting. This series that I'm doing, I don't know how long it's going to take, I don't care if it takes the whole year, is we need to get to a level, to a place, where we are obedient to God, because many of God's conditions is centered around obedience. And, and there are certain expectations from us. We've been going through the, through the Sermon on the Mount and, and we find that there seems to be some harsh conditions that Jesus places on a Christian or the expectations that he has for us. Okay? In, in chapter 6 of um, Matthew, part of the Sermon on the Mount, I'm not going to look into it now, but there, there were three specific places where he says, in, in the beginning it says, when you give to the needy, he says, to do it without making a big deal about it, okay? So, so therefore, there is an expectation that we give to the needy. Because he says, when you give to the needy, <laughs> He doesn't say, if you give to the needy. He says, so therefore there's an expectation that we give to the needy. Now, why is that? Well, we, what you sow is what you reap. So if you want God to provide your needs, and there are times when God expects you to provide for somebody else's needs. Okay? He says, when you do that. He didn't say, if you do that. He says, when you do that. And then a little bit later he says, when you pray... He didn't say, if you pray. He says, when you pray. And then he goes through the Lord's Prayer and he teaches him how to pray. But he doesn't ask us if we want to pray or it is when you pray. And then he gives us a guideline of prayer through the Lord's Prayer and he picks up the different points that should be involved in our prayer, which involves praise, it, it, it involves uh, seeking the will of God. It, it, it uh, involves asking for stuff. Uh, it, it speaks about being forgiving. There's not the temptation. It, so it goes into a, a area, but he says, he doesn't say, if you pray, he says, when you pray. So God's expectation from all of us is that we are prayers. Okay? It's not an uh, added requirement, it is our Christian life. So through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is saying, this is how a Christian functions. Okay, you love your enemies, you turn the other cheek, you are merciful, you're forgiving. That's, that is the expectation. And then he says a little bit further, you love this one. When you fast, not if you fast, it's when you fast. So, a great challenge for us this year, we might have some times is when we fast. Hallelujah. So, I might encourage us at different times to fast. 
because it's, it's, it, it is an expectation that Jesus gives to us that we do that. And, and all he's saying in these different things is, all these things, don't make a big deal about these things, it's just when you do it. He said, he said don't let everyone know that you're doing these things. But he's saying, this is what our normal expectation is. God wants us to grow something in our life that is faith. He wants to build faith. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 7 it says, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ, about Christ. Okay? So the word of God, as you personally study the word of God, God wants to build faith in you. Uh, when I preach, uh, hopefully, it's not the only time that you're in the Word, and hopefully it builds faith. Hallelujah. That's why it's important that your message, the messages are based on the Word of God. Great book, Romans. Love it. Faith is active, not passive. Okay, I, want to, I want to explain it. Faith is a verb. It's a doing word. Okay? There is something that you have to do if you want to have faith. Okay? It's, not, it's, not, it's not just believing and it'll come. Okay? If you want your marriage to grow, if you want relationship with your children to be good, if you want different things, if you, if you want to uh, be well provided for, then you have to, the way God could provide is to give you a job. <laughs> okay? So that means just because we have Centrelink doesn't say, well, that is God's provision for me. Okay? That's not God's provision for you. If you are uh, over retirement age, over retirement age, okay? And, and therefore you want a pension, that's okay. All right? But uh, God's provision comes in the form of doing. That, that I'm going to do, having done all, okay? So, th th so there is an expectation. The Bible tells us that if you're lazy, you shouldn't eat. So therefore, uh, so there are some things... So faith is active. So if you want certain things, you've got to do something about it. Okay? If you want to fulfill God's calling for your life, you need to seek his face. You may need some training. You need to, you need to be involved in stuff. Okay? It's, 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 it's active. It's not passive. Does that make any sense? And so therefore, we can pray... I'm having struggling in my marriage, I'm praying, I just want to pray, I want to pray, and I pray, and you do nothing. Well, your marriage probably won't grow much. And, and you might blame God for that. But in reality, he's saying, husbands, love your wives. Wives, be submitted to your husbands. Do. You fulfill your part with your children, don't exasperate your children. Train your children. Don't give them a hard time. And This is God's word in how to build relationships. Nobody loves me. No one rings me. I don't exist. And... We feel that way. But then you could go to the office and find some phone numbers and ring some people because you may get a call back. Is what you sow is what you reap. You see, what you do, you'll get back more. You know, the sowing and reaping, reaping principles, some will sow and reap 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. So the minimum you will get back is 30-fold. Sowing, reaping. It's a principle of God. See, you have to have an understanding of how it works. If you don't 
That's my job, is to, is to let you know how it works. And your job, to get into the Word of God, to find out what God is saying. What do you mean about these things? What is, my, what is God's will? What is God's expectation of me? Well, there are, I, I mentioned a few this morning. There, there are certain expectations that God has of us. Okay? By faith. Okay? So, see, it, it is believing or hoping for something you can't, haven't got. It's having confidence in hoping for something that you haven't got. The assurance of what... This is, this is what faith means. It's a very simple verse, but, it's, but it requires confidence. In ho- you can hope for something. So something's going to come out of something you haven't got. Okay, so, so if, if, if something you haven't got is what you want, you're in the right place. Because then faith requires, you can have confidence. You can have the assurance. Okay? But it does mean you've got to do something. It, it, it's just not going to come. Sometimes we expect God to do stuff, and it's almost like it, it's, it's, we need to be submitted to God, we need to worship Him, acknowledge Him, the creator of the whole universe. I mean, what a privilege we have that we can come boldly into His presence. Then don't come and, 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 and call the shots. It, it, it's bow ourselves to God. Say, Lord, it's amazing. I'm just so privileged to be here. Come, but I can come with confidence. I can come with boldness. But I have to re- reckon that to come in the presence of the one who created the whole universe, the whole galaxies, you know, there's billions of stars. Jesus made them. And then he came down in the form of a person. See, Jesus didn't just come in the form of a person as a baby and then grew up as a man and then became God. He always was God. He was there in the beginning before anything was created. You know, it, it, Christmas time is not uh, a time where, where, where we come across that, you know, this is the origin of Jesus, of God. Not the origin of God. It, it, he came down from heaven. John says, he was before I was. He was before everything was. This is the new year. We all know that. But the first day of the rest of your life starts today. You can make a decision and say, I'm going to be a person of faith. My level of faith is not where I want it to be. Who in this room has their level of faith exactly where they want it? Must have one. Nobody has that. So therefore, we all have a challenge and a mandate to reach, to lift our level of faith. And so in the future, I'm going to be, have greater expectation, have greater confidence of touching God, of seeing his will outworked in our life, find out what our calling is. What have you really called to me, Lord, for? What is the passion that you've placed in my heart? What is the burden that you have placed before me? Because I'm part of the kingdom of God, and God's will is to expand his his kingdom and to touch lives you might say well <clears throat> I'm not a people's person so therefore I'm a task orientated person so give me a challenge a task and I'll do it well God is a relational God and his main focus is people 
And, and, and some of us invo are involved with stuff because that's how we think. But God is more, in per in, more interested in the people in this building than the building. Did you know that? Now, it's great to have a building, but the church is made up of people. And, and I read that passage of Scripture before out of Romans chapter 12, and, and he says that we have different gifts that belong to one body. And everyone is important. And we need to find what gifting we have. Because you'll never find your place in the body of Christ if you don't understand the gifting that you have. And then if you, if you recognize a gifting, start to use it. If it is serving, serve. If it is giving to needs, give, it to, give to needs. If it is encouraging, encourage. If it is showing mercy, go and show mercy. If it is leadership, well then do it properly. If it is prophesying, well prophesy according to your faith. You see, God is interested in people. He's interested in you. He wants you to lift your level of expectation in the body of Christ. He wants you to have confidence in him. He wants you to have the ability to hear from him. He wants you to know that he loves you. If this is not happening, we've got a challenge. But it means you've got to do something. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Okay, so that means you have to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. His kingdom is on this earth and it's in heaven as well. It's an eternal kingdom. It's the greatest major enterprise in everywhere. It's the greatest enterprise on this earth. In this earth it's called church. His kingdom is called church. In heaven, it's an eternal kingdom. It goes forever. Faith is something that needs to be exercised. Okay, so faith is something that can grow. You know, um, I'll say many of us, I have to talk about past tense for me, uh, go to the gym. I haven't been to the gym for a little while. But uh, if you want to exercise, if you want to grow your muscles, if you want to do that, you've got to work it, right? Most people have been to a gym at some time in their life. If they haven't been to a gym, they've done a bit of running. If they haven't done that, they've done a bit of sport, they've done something. And at exercise, work, if you want to have strong arms, you've got to lift stuff, you know what I mean? You've got to eat well. So to exercise your body, you know what to do. Now, to exercise faith, you have to use it. You have to do it. You have to press forward. You have to believe God and trust God and spend time with God and then respond when he says something. I, I, I just want to put that in because that is the key. You know, like often, probably all the time, God is speaking to us. See, some of us don't hear it. Uh, we, we become oblivious to it because he's encouraged us so many times and we haven't done it. But the key is to obey him. I want you to do this. In your mind, he speaks to us in our mind, okay? The mind is, is the avenue where it first comes. This is what I'm thinking. God is saying, I want you to go and got to be careful of this, buy a bunch of flowers for your wife. Thank you. Okay? Now, that thought would come across your mind. Now, you have a choice. You've only got 20 bucks in your pocket. 
and you've got many uses for that 20 bucks. But it's going to take your whole 20 bucks to be obedient to what God is saying. Okay? This is the only way you grow spiritually is that every time God speaks to you, 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 you do what he says. You know, your mind goes, oh, that's of the devil. That's not of the devil. It's from God. And he, he's testing it to see if you're obedient. Do you really care about your marriage? You're praying about your marriage. Now, I'm telling you to go and take your wife out for tea or to buy tea. Say, it's okay, you don't have to cook. We'll go out or we'll, we'll get it. Okay. Relationship. Tell your wife that you love her. But men, you're instructed to do this. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Okay? So, so I'm not saying something that, that uh, he's not saying. God is saying that. It, 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 apart from loving one another and stuff like that, the Bible doesn't really tell the wife to love, you, love the husband. Apart from we have to love everybody. But not, not spe specifically. It says to respect him, to... Submit to him. But so therefore, if you do your bit, God will do his bit. God will touch your wife or your husband or your children and it'll happen. If you need, have a specific need, he may provide that need by you having to go out and work for it. But... It's listening to what he's saying. He might say to some of you guys, hey, you're spending too much time at work. It's because he, he, he speaks to us in that small, still voice. Okay? It won't come out as a, you know, thus saith the Lord, you are blah, blah, blah. No, it may not come like that. It, it'll come like a little whisper, like you know, a little thing like, not even a whisper, it's just a thought. Uh, you ought to go and do this. Go and ring Audrey. Now, you ever had a thought that to say that, you know, like you should go and ring somebody? But you're busy. <laughs> you know? But the thought came to your mind. Well, just maybe if you had a ring, that would have been just the right time for that person and said, well, I'm so glad you rang. I'm just going through this. Or you know what I mean? It's, it's the way God works. Because he is relational. He's a, he's a people's person. He's a people's God. It's the way he operates. Okay? It's what you sow, is what you reap. Okay? So therefore, sometimes you feel like being stroppy. Well, if you be stroppy, angry, unreasonable it'll get back to you because what you sow is what you reap if you want to be a person who is encouraged some people just need encouragement now, some people they can't live without encouragement well I want to suggest if you're, if you're like that you do a bit of encouraging it'll come back onto you 30 fold 60 fold, 100 fold. I think I should probably finish. But the challenge I've got here now is have expectation that God is going to move in your life this year and for on, forever. Okay, that you're going to grow this year more than you've ever grown. I don't care how old you are, I don't care but you're going to grow spiritually this year more than you ever. Faith is going to be something that's going to grow in your life. You're going to see major things happening. You're going to have a greater confidence in God will do things because you have that assurance. Remember that faith, consequently faith, hoping for the assurance of things you don't see and having confidence in that. Praise God.